During 2023, Earl Prentice shared his knowledge about the history of pit tag development during phone calls, emails, and interviews. This film is based on those events. Relevant photographs are rare. They are used as much as possible. Reenactments are also used to tell this story. It dawned on me the last time we had the workshop in 2015, there was just so many new people um, that I think a whole new generation, they, they really don't see the origins of this technology. I'd like to just focus on that aspect and put together a video that just talks about the origins of using pit tags and planted in fish, how you kind of came about it, and what were some of the challenges. This video discusses the conception and development of the full duplex passive integrated transponder tag, which is commonly known as the pit tag. Passive Integrated Transponder Tags, or PIT Tags for short, are tracking tags that do not require an internal power source, such as a battery. They are constructed of copper wire around a ferrite core. The brain of the PIT tag, a typical microchip, is encoded with a 14-character ID. Every PIT tag is unique. Durable, laser-sealed, and impermeable, this small glass cover seals and protects the inner circuitry and is harmless to the fish when properly implanted. A pit tag obtains its power from an external antenna that couples to the small antenna within the tag. When a pit tag passes close to one of these special antennas, it is activated and its unique code can be read. Today pit tags are used extensively for anadromous fish stock restoration and fish passage issues in the Columbia River Basin. There were some major steps in the pit tag development process, relevant to Pacific Northwest anadromous fish. First, there was the idea. Then, the evaluation to see how it affects the fish. There were a lot of small steps, both forward and backwards. In 1980, Earl Prentice worked for NOAA Fisheries. He was stationed at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center, Manchester Research Station. At that time, he was working on completing the life cycle of the spot prawn. The objective of his work was to determine if the spot prawn would be suitable for commercial aquaculture. As part of this work, he wanted to tag each of the research animals with an individual identifier. However, he discovered that none of the existing tagging systems were suitable for his needs. Then, while he was driving to work, Earl heard a story on the radio about a small tag that could be implanted in humans and used as a unique personal identifier. This detail in the story suggested to Earl that the tag probably had many of the attributes he was seeking for his work with spot prawns. It had a unique code that could not be altered. It could be read and processed rapidly through tissue. It was totally sealed from liquids. It was small in physical size, and it was not harmful to the carrier. This story sparked Earl's interest. He knew that if the tag described in the radio broadcast had these attributes and was found to be safe for use in fish, it could be a useful tool in his and other fisheries work. It took Earl several months and many phone calls to trace the story on the radio. He eventually learned Mr. Vern Taylor was behind the story. Mr. Taylor was a pretty wealthy individual who owned racehorses. After some of his horses were stolen, he wanted to find a better method for identification than the tattoos used at that time. While searching for alternative tools, he found a tag that was used on railroads to identify rolling stock. The tag was huge. Mr. Taylor thought the size could be reduced and it could incorporate attributes that would enable him to use the tag in horses and livestock. Consequently, he set into action a plan to get investment money to do just that. His plan was to plan a new story about a new tag that could potentially be put into the hand of a person. They could wave it over a reader in the store, just like a credit card. Earl presented the tag concept to Dr. Conrad Mankin, 
the director of the NOAA Manchester Research Station, and others, during a staff meeting. He received a mixed response from the group. However, they suggested that he visit Mr. Taylor, the owner of Identification Devices Incorporated, IDI, at their headquarters in Colorado, to discuss his system development plans, timetables, and the features Earl thought would be necessary for a fish tag. Earl knew that individuals within NOAA and Bonneville Power Administration BPA, were eager for a new tool that would provide accurate, near real-time data, using less human effort and fewer tagged animals, to address numerous questions related to Columbia River Basin salmon and steelhead trout stocks. This helped him get some money from NOAA to meet with Mr. Taylor in Colorado. At the time of Earl's visit at IDI's facility in Colorado, their pit tag development program was totally focused on livestock, because that had become their source of tag development money, and this was where Mr. Taylor's interest lay. Mr. Taylor promised the tag size would be reduced to 6 mm in length, and 2 mm in diameter. Earl admits he was totally naive, and bought into what Mr. Taylor was saying. After returning from Colorado, Earl again briefed the Manchester staff. They were encouraging, and suggested that he prepare a proposal for BPA, to describe the potential attributes of the pit tag for marking salmon, and the steps he would take to determine its suitability, and safety, for use with free-swimming juvenile and adult salmon. In 1982, Earl wrote the proposal for BPA. In early 1983, he received notification from BPA, that they would fund a multi-year, cooperative study, between themselves and the National Marine Fisheries Service, titled, A Study to Determine the Biological Feasibility, of a New Fish Tagging System. This resulted in the first of many progress reports, beginning in 1984. The first phase of research was to develop a means by which to insert the tag into juvenile salmon identify the anatomical areas where the tag could be safely inserted and remain in position ascertain the tissue response to the tag determine the effect of the tag on growth survival behavior and wound healing define the tag operating life and quantify tag retention over time earl did a lot of the initial work in the manchester lab with the help of numerous staff members he acknowledges if it were not for the staff caring for the test fish, conducting various studies, and collaborating at every step of the way, the project would not have been a success. Eventually, NOAA's electronics shop at Sandpoint, Washington, and the NOAA team at PASCO got involved, along with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Bringing the pit tag to fisheries applications was a cooperative effort that ranged from technicians to upper management. Determining a means to tag the fish was a challenge. Earl recalls the first attempts at tagging were conducted with non-functional tags, using juvenile and adult mortalities, from other studies being conducted at the Manchester Research Station. The initial tagging tests helped identify potential tagging sites, and aided in developing an inexpensive and practical tool for tagging. Unfortunately, the very first live fish I tagged, died because I failed to place a hole in the bottom of the syringe, for air escapement. Subsequent live fish tests used various age classes, sizes, and species of salmonids. As for the pit tag itself, Earl claims, This tag has probably been evaluated more than any other tag, prior to being used by the fisheries community. The development process was slow, and frustrating at times. Earl started off with non-functional tags. They had an electronic component that was inserted into a sealed, polypropylene cylinder. They were smaller than the proposed functional, 400 kHz tags. Non-functional tags enabled tagging equipment and techniques to be developed, and later verified when functional tags became available. Unfortunately, the sealing on the early tags was crude, and the ends would damage the inside of the fish. When they managed to correct the ceiling so it was smooth, they found that after several months in the water, they would leak, and kill the electronics in the tag. They next tried glass, but the end was more pointed than it is now, and it could snap off. Finally, 
After many attempts by the tag manufacturer, a satisfactory tag sealing process was developed. In 1986, Earl received the first glass encapsulated tags. They were full duplex, 12 mm in length, 2.1 mm in diameter, and operated at 400 kHz. This again led to a repeat of numerous studies, under controlled conditions, to ensure the tag would be satisfactory for fisheries applications. Earl had done quite a bit of tagging with the old plastic tag, and the fish were surviving at high levels. With the switch to glass tags, he wanted them pressure tested. After the tags were pressure tested, they checked a sample for cracks, and then conducted tagging tests on live fish. This led to another problem. He recalls, They sent me a package of pressure tested tags, which I immediately evaluated. The results were very alarming, since nearly all of the fish died within a day. This was unlike the results of any of my previous tag tests. After a discussion with IDI, and additional testing, the problem was traced to the red dye used to pressure test the tags. The dye could not be seen on the tags, but the dye residue was sufficient to kill juvenile salmonids. A different dye was used in all subsequent tag pressure tests, with no problems. It was a struggle getting the first tags, but the first readers left a lot to be desired also, especially in the distance at which tags could be read. Whit Patton was an electrical engineer for IDI. He liked fish, and dedicated his time to Noah's project. With his work, and his expertise, the first interrogation system was installed at McNary Dam, on the Columbia River, during 1987. Shielding the antennas from ambient, RFID interference, and the metal in the concrete around them, was another issue that had to be resolved. Recording the data also presented a significant challenge. Everything was recorded with a computer and printer. All of the data was printed out in real time. The printers would jam regularly, even when kept inside heated instrument rooms. In 1988, it was concluded that a professionally designed and managed pit tag database, that resided on a mainframe computer, was required to meet contractual and verbal agreements with BPA and various fishery agencies. As a result, a cooperative agreement was made with the Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission PSMFC, to develop and manage a prototype pit tag database, using the coded wire tag database as a model. This also helped to alleviate concern about the tag data being stored on an individual's computer. The prototype program was available, and used to process data, during the 1989 season. However, it had usability issues and required further refinement. The present database system, called PTAGUS, was developed over the next few years, and it is still housed at PSMFC, in Portland, Oregon. It was clear to all parties, that the development of the database system was a dynamic process, and required oversight from the fisheries community. Thus, an oversight team, the Pit Tag Steering Committee, was formed with representatives from the various user groups. There have been several other significant developments over the years, far too many to list all of them here. However, a few notable ones are. The first Pit Tag Separation by Code System, was deployed at Lower Granite Dam, in 1993. The Columbia River Pit Tag Interrogation System was converted from 400 kHz to a 134.2 kHz ISO system in 2000. The 2000 Biological Opinion referred to the Pit Tag as a useful tool for fishery managers to use in addressing the many questions regarding stock restoration and fish passage issues. This document became the driving force directing BPA and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, to support future pit tag development work, and the tools used. In 2001, the first small stream pit tag systems, were installed on Abernathy and Rattlesnake Creeks, within the Columbia River Basin. In 2004, half-duplex pit tags were used to tag Pacific Lamprey, for the first time in the Pacific Northwest. What are some pit tag innovations that Earl thinks you may address, or witness, during your fisheries career? A few of these are already in some stage of development. 
It is time to change the tag's glass encapsulant material to another one that is biologically inert for safety reasons. Technology has advanced to a point where it may be possible to develop a special pit tag that has sensors of various types. The sensor information might be time and date stamped for readings of blood pH, cortisol levels, and other physiological characteristics. Studies directed at determining stress and various diseases could benefit from such tag attributes. Modify the tag's encapsulant so that the tag's antenna is incorporated within or on the interior wall of the encapsulant. This would significantly increase the antenna's overall size, which could result in a longer read range. Develop a passive-active tag. For example, a tag that is passive, such as the present pit tag, but also has a holographic, micro, lithium-ion, battery which is rechargeable. Once this type of power is available, a new level of performance and a number of new applications can be envisioned. The technology now exists. However, it is still in the development stage. Earl's take-home message about the future of pit tag technology innovations is, all of this may be possible, but people just have to think out of the box. Earl asserts, the development of pit tag technology for fisheries applications is a good example of the federal government spearheading the original development and in turn passing it on to the private sector for further refinement to address the specific needs of the community. A very successful joint cooperative effort developed and it continues to this day. Earl emphatically credits a dedicated group working towards the common goal of protecting and restoring our precious fisheries resources. I appreciate you understanding where I came from on this project, how it started, but there are so many people, so many people. All I did was kick the ball and the rest of the people ran with it. I came up with the concept, but it was team effort with many other dedicated and forward thinking individuals that ultimately moved this technology forward. I think the whole community should be thanked for their support. This is not a one-person show, by any means. It's a community that worked together to form this. We're talking about federal, tribes, states, private sector, and individuals. In addition, Earl acknowledges the support provided by the significant others of those involved with this work, such as his wife, Jan. The work, and ultimate success that he and others accomplished could not have occurred without that steadfast support. What this project should inspire is you thought outside the box. You were presented immense challenges and even even like you just said with the pressure testing almost, you know, stop progress. And yes. maybe that would be in, inspiring for this next generation of researchers to, to see where you came from, your point of view, the challenges you overcame. You were working with new technology and raw materials and nothing had been tried before. And, you know, and I think it's, that's something inspiring for others. Everybody just looks at this uh, technology and the database and the data that's behind it. And I think they kind of take it for granted.